All right. Yes, this was a, a fairly significant tornado day, as, uh, as uh, it was alluded to on this day. Let me just show you the charts that we went through. And this is what we had, again, 24 hours earlier. I think everybody had a sense of this uh, uh, 250 jet structure uh, 24 hours later, and particularly the continued strong digging jet uh, in the western U.S., and if you uh, especially looked in the area of Missouri, uh, western Arkansas, eastern Oklahoma, certainly diffluence at 250, uh, implication of divergence aloft, uh, but pretty pronounced uh, splitting if you draw, drew uh, streamlines along there. Um, this is at 500, again, uh, 24 hours earlier, and then 0Z on the 28th. So if we just go through these, we can see the system coming out strongly um, to the east and stronger winds aloft, especially working their way uh, across the southern plains and uh, into the central plains region. And again, the colder air aloft coming in from the west. This was 700 millibars 24 hours earlier. Um, there were some increases. I, I, I don't know if you can see where I circled the dew point changes 24 hours earlier. And they were coming up 7 degrees, 6 degrees, 11 degrees at Jackson. So there was moisture coming up um, in some of the Mississippi Valley um, region, even 24 hours earlier, even though the, the absolute magnitude was relatively low. And then by the time we get to here, I went ahead and did the temperature and our dew point analysis on here and I, from zero degrees above and up. And you can definitely see a change in the, the moisture field, the narrow axis coming on up from Louisiana, Arkansas northward, but then also seeing relatively dry air at 700 immediately in the wake of that. So you're getting most likely upward motion followed by subsidence in through that area. And some suggestion that there may have then been a feature, some type of shortwave trough or perturbation in the flow that might be moving through that area. And then 850, I think as most people saw, uh, the moisture increasing northward, the system and particularly the dry line showing up uh, farther to the east in the southern plains area, um, reasonably uh, broad enough moisture axis um, from East Texas across the lower Mississippi Valley and then up into the, the mid-Mississippi Valley. A lot of the controlling influence that takes place in the atmosphere indeed occurs above the ground in the mid and upper levels. The atmosphere is obviously a three-dimensional structure. It isn't just at the ground. Um, but it just so happens that most of us live at the ground. And for that reason, what's taking place near the surface is important. I heard a story once from way back at the old uh, University of Chicago days, after uh, Rossby may still have been there, but Pedersen was there. I don't know if you're familiar that Pedersen wrote a two-part book on synoptic weather analysis and forecasting. And Pedersen was very, um, a very astute professor. And they were having map discussion one day. And the person giving the map discussion was going on and on about the 500 millibar pattern, Rossby waves, how the pattern was evolving and changing. And after about 10 minutes, Pedersen raised his hand and from what I heard said, well, this is all very well and good about what's happening at 500 millibars. He said, but I have yet to meet anybody who lives at 500 millibars. Can you tell me what this means for the weather at the ground? And that sent a message, of course, is that while we can focus on what's taking place in the mid or upper levels, the reason we're doing that is to try and give us information and clues as to what the weather is going to be doing in the lower levels of the atmosphere. So we're going to talk today about surface analysis. And this is something that has a much longer history than upper air analysis. And I'm going to spend a little time, if you don't mind, going back with a little bit of a historical stroll through the past. So we're going to start with, uh, again, the historical overview and going all the way back to the beginning of the US Weather Services. 
and early tornado prediction, then switch into mesoanalysis and how this came about talk about how we do surface analysis at the SPC. And then again, because you had so much fun with the upper air charts, we're going to get a, a surface chart to do for the same, valid at the same time that you did the upper air charts. But this time, everybody's going to get a surface chart. Everybody gets to do uh, one on their own. So how did things in the beginning, so to speak? Um, Back in 1870, Congress authorized a National Weather Service. It wasn't called that, and it was actually part of the Army Signal Corps. Uh, Army Signal Corps dealt with the communications, telegraph, and of information that, that was deemed to be interest to the country. A uh, chief meteorologist was appointed, Cleveland Abbey. He was also the founding editor of Monthly Weather Review Journal. And he was a very interesting individual. He was actually affiliated with the Cincinnati Observatory at the time, but he had a great interest in meteorology. And a year later, in 1871, he began issuing a product for the Great Lakes, the Atlantic coastal region, and the Gulf Coast, because it was, they were interested in weather's effect on shipping and commerce. And he called the product weather synopsis and probabilities, which is very interesting that he used the word probabilities because at the time they weren't really probabilistic forecasts, but perhaps he was uh, envisioning things down the road. So rather than saying weather synopsis and forecast, he actually called it weather synopsis and probabilities. And by 1872, the Signal Corps started collecting weather observations and producing forecasts across the country. And it was uh, proclaimed that this was to benefit agriculture and commerce, that it was important for the economy. Most of you may know, maybe you don't, that the Weather Service at this time is in the Department of Commerce in the US government. Um, prior to 1940, and after being removed from the Signal Corps, it was, uh, the Weather Bureau was actually in the Department of Agriculture. So the idea of having agriculture and commerce, uh, having a need to know about weather, uh, has been around for a very long time. So back in the Army Signal Corps, someone named John Finley, John Park Finley, is pretty well known as the first tornado forecaster. He enlisted in the Army Signal Corps in 1877, was assigned to Philadelphia. And for reasons that we don't really know, I don't know, he had a great interest in tornadoes. Um, he was from Michigan, Lower Michigan, near Jackson. But it wasn't because he was ordered to do this. He had an interest in this. And he started to do some very detailed studies the first studies of tornadoes in this country. He collected a climatology, he had surface data, and came up with surface patterns associated with tornadoes, and he recognized that we needed to have improved observations of tornadoes. And he established a network of volunteer, what he called tornado reporters. We were not considered them storm spotters. But this was way back in the late 1870s. Um, that he established a network essentially of tornado spotters in the Great Lakes and Plain States. This is an example of one of the outbreak case maps that he developed. This was a, uh, what Joe Galway, one of the early sales forecasters, called the Enigma outbreak because if you looked in the literature, the death toll was from somewhere under 200 to more than 1,200. They don't know how many, but it was a Swarm of tornadoes across the southeastern states on February 19th, 1884. So it was most likely a cool season, strongly forced event across the southeast states. This is a reenactment, so to speak, of the surface map that Joe Galway did. You can see very little in the way of surface stations, just one or two per state. But this is Basically, what Finley came up with for each of his cases, he took what limited data he had at the ground and tried to come up with a surface map that indicated, to some extent, temperature, dew point, winds, and as I'll show in a moment, 
he really came up with the idea of boundaries between air masses at the time. So this is his climatology that he came up with through 1885. He went back over 100 years, and you can see areas where there were a lot of tornadoes, in part because of the uh, spotter network that was developed in the Great Lakes and some of the plain states. Um, he set up shop in Kansas City, which was kind of interesting because that was quite a ways before uh, the cells unit set up shop in Kansas City. You'll also notice some areas where there were very few spotters or tornado reporters, say West Virginia and Virginia. And there's even an area down here in the south central states that had very few tornadoes. And if you look closely on the map, it's a little bit hard to see. It's called Indian Territory. And there were very few tornado reporters in this particular area that we are today. This is a composite of three cases that he came up with. And these are the tornadoes, the tornado tracks showing up in through here, these short lines. You can see the wind flow. You can see the appearance of a low pressure area. And you can see what appears to be a fairly sharp cold front. So he had identified some very key features associated with tornadoes. And the thing that was kind of amazing was this was about 40 years before um, Bjerknes and so others in um, the Bergen School had come up with the Norwegian Polar Front Theory. So through careful analysis of surface data, he came up with rules for tornado forecasting, looking at the pressure, temperature, dew point, and winds. And some of his rules are included right here. Tornadoes occur in a different portion of the surface low, south and east of high contrast of temperature and moisture, south and east of contrast of cool northerly and warm southerly winds. And that tornadoes are more frequent in the major axis of the barometric troughs trend north-south or northeast-southwest. So he's basically talking about cold fronts primarily from the limited data that he had. So this is based on information in the mid-1880s that he was actually able to do surface analysis, couple that with tornado reports, and come up with probably the first connections between surface patterns, surface parameters, and tornado occurrence. So he began experimental tornado forecast actually in 1884, and he did this for a few years. But there were a series of political events in the Signal Corps that by the late 1880s, he was pretty much finished with this type of work. There was a, an embezzlement scandal in the Signal Corps, lo and behold. And some people didn't like the work that he was doing. So he was ordered to stop making the tornado forecast. You can see the quote at the bottom in the annual report of the chief signal officer. It is believed that the harm done by such a prediction would eventually be greater than that which results from the tornado. And this continued for a very long time into the mid 20th century that people said, we can't really forecast tornadoes. We're going to just scare people. We're causing more harm than we are doing good. By 1891, Weather Service was transferred to the Agriculture Department and became the Weather Bureau. And the person who was named chief of the Weather Bureau did not like what Finley had done in the Signal Corps with tornado reporters, statistics. He thought the whole thing was a bunch of hooey, and it was discontinued. If we go back and think about analysis, we really only had surface data to use through the 1930s. Really didn't have balloons. There were very few airplanes, although there were some kites and things like that. There were some efforts to launch some balloons a long time ago by early enthusiasts. We had a hard time getting a hold of this particular picture. But now that I see Ariel in the room, I can tell that he recognizes it. Because when we dug a little farther, these were the people who were actually doing it at that particular time. Some examples of surface chart analysis. This was an early paper in Monthly Weather Review, April 42, Development and Trajectory of Tornadoes. Here's a surface map of a particular case um, in the south central, southeastern states. 
J.R. Lloyd was at the Weather Bureau in Washington at the time. He subsequently transferred, became the MIC at the Kansas City District Office. And he was one of the really early pioneers in the Weather Bureau who was not only interested in tornado research, but in prediction. And he was pretty well set to do his own predictions from the Kansas City office uh, before there was a national forecasting effort in this uh, particular uh, area of forecasting. There was a report during World War II, the, what at the time was a relatively uh, unknown but later became famous Showalter and Falk's report on tornadoes where they analyzed both surface data and early soundings to assess conditions associated with, um, with tornadoes. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the, the Showalter Index. Um, he was the one who developed that, where you lift a parcel from 850 millibars, compare that lifted parcel temperature to the environmental temperature at 500, and you get an index. J.R. Falks was actually the first head of the um, Severe Storm Center when it was in Washington. He later became the meteorologist in charge of the Chicago District Office of the Weather Bureau and remained there for a great many years. And I, I don't know if I should be proud or embarrassed. Um, when I was a, in, as an undergrad in, my, in the summers between my uh, junior and senior and after my senior year, um, I actually worked at the Chicago District Office uh, Joe Falks was the MIC at the time, and I did not know he was as famous and powerful as he turned out to be. So this was a fairly famous work. This is uh, one of the analyses of a particular uh, severe weather episode in the south central states, and you can see the, the surface analysis. Again, not many stations, uh, emphasis on air mass uh, source regions and types and uh, even a cold front aloft uh, showing up in there. 1948 is probably the start of what's considered the modern era, not very far from here at Tinker Air Force Base. On March uh, 25th is considered the first successful tornado forecast. Uh, five days earlier on March 20th, a tornado went through Tinker Air Force Base, caused tremendous damage. The base commander was very unhappy told Faubish and Miller, who were weather officers at the time, don't let this happen again. If there's going to be a tornado that hits the base, I want to know about it ahead of time. Five days later, they look at the charts, and they were somewhat similar. And they said, there's no way in the world another tornado is going to hit this exact base five days later. We can't make a forecast. Well, the base commander came by and said, what are you guys looking at? They said, well, it looks like there's severe weather possible in this general area. And he said, are you going to make a tornado forecast for uh, Twister to hit the base? And they looked at each other and they said, we can't do that. We'll lose our jobs. We'll lose our career. Everyone will think we're fools. He said, do you think there could be a tornado today? And they said, well, it could be, but it's really unlikely it's going to hit the base again. And he said, are you going to make a forecast? And he basically forced them into making a forecast that there's going to be another tornado. Well, Faubush in particular wrote this up in his biography. He said, I've ruined my career. I'm the laughing stock of everybody. According to his memoirs, he goes home at 6 o'clock at night. He turns the radio on, no TV. And he says, why in the world are they talking about that tornado from five days ago? Can't they give that thing up? And because he thinks, well, they're talking about a tornado hitting Tinker. It's got to be five days ago. As it turns out, there was another tornado that day that hit Tinker again. And because they had moved planes out, there was much less damage because of that forecast. And instead of being run out of the Air Force, he and Farbush became heroes. And that established the idea that maybe we can forecast tornadoes. But it was a very low probability, I think everybody knows. But sometimes miracles happen and their career was saved. This is some of the work that they had done. This is a paper in BAMS in 51 about forecasting tornado development. And what are they talking about? Chart analysis, both at the surface and aloft, in terms of patterns and parameters that are favorable for severe weather. So they documented a large number of cases in the 40s and early 50s. 
They had a large climatology. They analyzed maps for each case, identified what they call different tornado patterns and air masses. And they developed guidelines for chart analysis focusing on, fe focusing on features that are particularly important for tornado forecasting. We looked at the 850 chart. You all drew your moisture axis. That's what they recommended. Look at the thermal and moisture patterns and axes, dry intrusions such as we could have seen at 700 millibars, zones of wind maxima, where the jet streams, you did that. And then the concept of composite charts, which is putting together a sing on a single chart um, features at different levels in the atmosphere. This is an example, conceptual approach of their type B tornado pattern, and you can see the 850 jet coming up, the mid-level 500 millibar jet, the dry intrusions at 850 and 700 millibars in through here, the low-level moisture is shown at 850, cold front coming in from the northwest, and you put these features together, and this is where they said, you better be on the lookout for severe weather. Well, a few years later, the Weather Bureau had taken so much heat for not issuing tornado forecasts while the Air Force was that they established what was called the Severe Local Storm Center in 1952 in Washington, D.C. They moved to Kansas City in 1954 and in 56 published a forecasting guide for tornadoes and severe thunderstorms. This is a rather historic uh, volume because as you can see here, it was considered forecasting guide number one. This hadn't been done. It started a series um, in the Weather Bureau, and it focused on analysis of surface and upper air charts and soundings. This is an example of continuity maps at three hourly intervals for a particular case in the uh, midsection, Mississippi Valley of the country, and saying, this is what you've got to do. You've got to analyze charts if you want to have a sense of what's going on and where the severe weather threat is. So by the early 50s, there was renewed focus in this country on surface analysis and what it could do for you in terms of forecasting tornadoes and severe storms. And this really could be considered the start of mesoscale analysis or shorten that to mesoanalysis. The interesting thing is the roots of mesoscale, as far as I could find, came about in a review article by Myron Legda. He was a uh, radar meteorologist down at Texas A&M. And he had put together a review article, and in it, he used the word mesometeorological. And if you can read the quote at the bottom, it's basically it's smaller than synoptic scale, larger than micro scale. It is anticipated radar will provide useful information concerning structure and behavior not covered by either micro or synoptic scale studies. Phenomena of this size might as well be designated as mesometeorological. Kind of like, well, I don't know what else to call it. Let's do this. Well, there were other things taking place at this time. Um, there was a Weather Bureau research scientist by the name of Morris Tepper, and he came up with an interesting idea that gravity waves might generate squall lines, and where these gravity waves intersect might be a location for tornadoes. You could see the gravity waves by looking at barograph data and see pressure jumps in the barograph traces, and where you have these intersecting pressure jump lines, maybe that can give us an idea where tornadoes are liable to occur. And the higher-ups bought this. They said, yeah, we'll set up a special observing network in the plains in 1951. So you can see it covered some of northern and northwest Oklahoma, mostly Kansas, some of Nebraska, eastern Colorado. You can see the location of the stations. Most of the time they had wind and pressure observations, not necessarily temperature and dew point. Well, tested it out in 51, and they really didn't come up with much. And you can see the quote from Tepper, unfortunately for meteorological knowledge, the setting up of the tornado project seems to have provided the people of Kansas with the best tornado insurance they ever had. For the present writing, there have been no tornadoes. So another clue that when you set up field experiments, sometimes the atmosphere is reluctant to give up its secrets, and you try and study it, and it doesn't do too much. Vortex Southeast last year was a nice example of that. But, so Tepper concluded within a couple of years, majority of tornadoes developed through some mechanism other than intersecting pressure jump lines. But, 
they had all this high resolution data that they could start to work with. And this has really provided a breakthrough in analysis and forecasting. This is another important paper. This was done by Fujita after he had just come over here from Japan at the University of Chicago, along with Tepper and another meteorologist with the Weather Bureau, um, Neustein. And this was called mesoanalysis, an important scale in the analysis of data. This was 1956. And in the preface, it was rather interesting. The primary purpose of this is to prevent a significant scale of meteorological events. This scale, the mesoscale, is either overlooked or intentionally ignored. When, if a thunderstorm hits a surface station, typically the wind will shift, you'll have a pressure rise, and if you aren't sure what's going on, that data, also temperature will cool, the data might not seem to fit if that's all you had. If you didn't have radar, you didn't have satellite. So a lot of times folks would see that and they didn't know what to do with it. And they didn't draw for it because they didn't know how to interpret it. it. Says the reason normally given is that these meteorological motions are noise superimposed on larger scale. And it's really the larger scale that we have to be concerned with. But they said this noise is directly tied up with local weather and the meteorologists will have to despair of ever being able to predict this local weather unless, well, it says he, has an accurate knowledge of what's going on in the mesometeorological scale. So they recognize there's something going on here that's probably important that's been ignored up to now, and we should start to pay attention to it. This is an example of one of their analyses of a particular case in the Central Plains. And one of the things that you notice is the use of color. I've been told that this was the first use of color in analysis that was published um, in the US, is this particular um, mesoanalysis volume that they did. But you can see the meso high associated with a convective system, wake lows in through here. Um, very, very detailed analysis, which was Fujita's hallmark in terms of not analysis and interpretation and understanding what is this telling us. So, data from the Tornado Project Network was used by a number of folks to create conceptual models of thunderstorm systems. This is a paper that Fujita published in the old Journal of Meteorology in 1959 precipitation and cold air production in mesoscale thunderstorm systems. And you can see his unique um, utilization of surface data, identifying very tight boundaries in both pressure and temperature at times. Here's another example of a meso high in uh, the same paper. Another paper that he published in TELUS in 55 on squall lines. And you start to get the sense of we have a developing conceptual model in three dimensions of what's taking place in a thunderstorm system. This is more from Fujita in the AMS monograph in 63 of initiation of convective systems either in the warm sector on the southern, uh, the bottom row um, near the boundary or on the cool side and what it may look like as systems move through. Again, based on that thunderstorm project mesodata. So what Fujita and his colleagues came up in terms of convective mesosystems, such as a gust front and outflow boundary, cold pools, meso highs, meso lows, things that we recognize fairly quickly today, um, they had to come up with. There was no, uh, nothing in the book, so to speak, at that time. And what they came up with at that time is still extremely useful today. Here's some additional work uh, from Grant Darko, who used to be at the University of Missouri, talking about looking at the surface patterns, analyzing surface temperature in great detail, and that this may tell you something about the location where tornadoes uh, may occur, because if you're in a thermal axis, you're warmer, you may be more unstable in that particular location. Uh, Northwest Flow, Boeco, Bob John's work um, that showed up in the, in the early 90s, you can see the example of uh, what was a developing derecho system in Minnesota at the time. And boy, doesn't that look nice? Temperature dew point 91, 80, 94, 80. 
9481, pretty juicy. Um, Rich McNulty, when he was uh, at, at Topeka, again, talking about convective systems and how to analyze them. Uh, the April 3rd outbreak, this was a, a work that Steve Corfiti led um, at the Storm Prediction Center. And again, I mentioned this briefly the other day, a lot of hand analysis uh, in this particular published paper. These are some of the charts that uh, are in there. This is zero Z on the third. And you can see as time goes on how the moisture comes up northward fairly rapidly. Convective systems uh, begin to develop. This is system number one uh, showing up. And as you see the moisture coming northward, um, every three hours, different convective systems begin to develop, tornadoes begin to develop, and uh, the analysis plays a large role in assessing what is taking place on this particular day. And I'll just carry it through to 12Z the next morning. So 